Hello there, everyone. Thanks for coming back to listen to more of the show. My guest for this episode is Yuri Deegan. He is the CEO of Ethereum Genetics and works with anti-aging, but over the course of the past uh, 13, 14 months or so, he's been mainly focusing on COVID origins. So in this episode, we go over some of his anti-aging work off the bat, uh, pretty much for the sake of my own curiosity. And then uh, for the most part, we just discuss uh, COVID origins and primarily the lab leak hypothesis, which merely a, oh, let's see, just a couple months ago, it was still highly stigmatized and completely taboo. And within at least the English speaking countries for completely ridiculous reasons. And uh, now it is not so stigmatized. And But we go over that, the whole taboo and the lab leak hypothesis itself and uh, how things look for the future for possibly figuring out the origins of SARS-CoV-2. So I hope you enjoyed this conversation. I certainly did. Cheers, guys. Well, thanks for coming on, Yuri. Uh, let's start off with uh, what you've been working on primarily, I'm assuming, for the past few years, or maybe more, with uh, anti-aging, and uh, before we, we jump into the lab leak hypothesis. So just uh, go over uh, what your work is there, and as well, uh, what you've been uh, trying to get done with that throughout the past year while still trying to tackle the, the COVID issue. Sure. Uh, yeah, like basically the past few years, I've been work, working on a, a life extension therapy. So basically, we're trying to create a gene therapy to prolong our lifespan and to prolong our youth span. We don't want to, you know, make people live older in a lo- in a, live longer in an older state, but we want to live as long as possible in as young as possible a state or as a healthy a possible estate uh, as you know we can get so uh, i'm working on a particular concept that is called epigenetic rejuvenation basically we're trying to uh, freeze or roll back our epigenetic levels or levels of our gene expression to as youthful a pattern as possible or at least freeze them at the same stage that we are all in right now because with age they tend to exponentially deteriorate essentially and so we're developing, you know, uh, now testing in uh, cell cultures, in animals, this approach of, uh, you know, using the reprogramming factors for uh, rejuvenation, essentially. Um, so, yeah, I've been doing that for a few years now. Uh, and uh, we're, you know, hopefully, fingers crossed, we'll get some good results uh, in, uh, in less than a year. And I'll be able to tell people a little bit more uh, about that. But I mean, in terms of the approach, uh, everything is pretty much outlined in both our, my Medium posts or online, or, you know, you can just check out my LinkedIn or the website for the startup. And the approach is that we, it's called partial reprogramming or epigenetic rejuvenation via partial reprogramming. It's all outlined there, you know, there's a white paper, if you want to get into the details, and I mean this this is a, uh, a this is a novel approach that is also embraced by kind of heavyweights in the longevity space, like David Sinclair has been you know harping on it for a while. It's been on Joe Rogan talking about this informational theory of aging of his, and uh, you know there's many people who have embraced this concept and are now trying to essentially turn it into a therapy from just kind of research. Uh, discovery to a therapy that we can practically use uh, for human life extension and uh, youth extension because you know it's much more important and much more fun to extend you know your good young healthy years than the older ones so i mean if if you have any questions about the therapy or the approach i'm happy to you know dive into more details or if you're kind of you know <laughs> anxious to get into like the fun stuff with covid origins mm-hmm. We can do that first or, you know, see how, how things go. Yeah, sure. Um, on your point, you don't want to be 90 for 100 years or something like that. So, yeah, your, your point is well I want taken. to be biologically 25 for as long <laughs> as possible, yeah. 
And yeah, I'm yeah, pretty yeah. sure most people will too. So <laughs> when, when given a chance, I mean, some people, they're like, oh, I don't mind getting older. And, uh, but like they still uh, buy cosmetic products or they go for, uh, you know, cosmetic surgery or do any kind of like things that make them look younger. And obviously if there was a therapy that will actually physically make you look, not just look, but be younger and, you know, feel younger and be healthier. Uh, definitely, I think like 99% of people will uh, be willing to take that therapy. Uh, can you give a, a preview as to what this might be that you're, you're releasing within the next year? Oh, we're not releasing within the next year. Within the next oh, year, we're I, just expecting results in animals oh, to uh, oh, kind of, uh, support our hypothesis. Oh, I, I uh, meant the the, the re results that you might be releasing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, yeah. It'll be just some animal studies, and unfortunately, I can't go into the detail right now. But ultimately, what we are thinking about is a gene therapy that will deliver the genes, the rejuvenation genes, into various tissues of your body that the, we, you will then uh, induce or you will then turn on, on on demand when you need to periodically roll back your epigenetics so periodically rejuvenate yourself. You will then take some small molecule that will activate those genes for a certain period of time, make you younger or healthier, and basically give you the next, I don't know, weeks or months of this kind of rejuvenated state will which you will then need to then again roll back because you know unfortunately aging works uh, only one way right now so to prevent it from getting as i said exponentially worse we would need to at least with our approach we would need to periodically bring back the epigenetic profile uh, to a youthful level and so this is kind of the idea of the you know thirty thousand feet view of our gene therapy and, uh, you know, but yeah, until we actually are able to get to the market, it's still years and years of first animal studies, then clinical trials and so on. But I think like validating the approach will, will take maybe less than a year, or maybe a couple of years. And I'm, I'm also very hopeful that it's not just us who will have some good results from animals, but also other groups like David Sinclair's group out of Harvard, maybe group out of Stanford and others who are also working on this partial reprogramming and it's getting noticed because I know there's like now grants from some rich people's foundations who are trying to fund particular this partial reprogramming approach and uh, I, I think you know it's going to get a lot of visibility funding which brings a lot more research into uh, into the focus for this particular approach and we'll have results after results in the next few years just coming out, which hopefully there'll be good results. But I mean, at least this research, research will be conducted, which is, you know, the most important thing. And the, the biggest problem with aging research is just that there's just not enough of it, not enough research into the fundamental uh, mechanisms of aging. There's a lot of research, a lot of money spent on cancer research, a lot of money spent on Alzheimer's research. But all of these areas, they're downstream of the cause of all of this, mm -hmm. which is aging. Aging itself predisposes us to uh, increase, exponential increase in cancer rates, exponential increase in dementia rates. So, but the amount of funding that is spent on fundamental mechanisms of aging is, you know, hundred times, thousands times, thousand times less than the amount of funding spent on cancer or other, you know, fashionable, more fashionable. Uh, you know, uh, downstream effects of aging. But anyways, I can talk about aging for hours. I think is, is that is that is that because people have been uh, for a long period of time uh, just didn't think that they could deal with senescence at all, and so they they just deal with all the things that that end up as a result of senescence. Senescence. Well, yeah, I think it's just like historically the history of, of medicine focuses on the problem at hand. And the problem at hand is usually some kind of bad things that happen already kind of way too late from the initial cause of that problem. You know, you look, you, you get cancer, you start thinking, how do we treat cancer? You get cardiovascular issues, you, you think about preventing those or dementia and so on. But like the separate area of research that kind of looks in all 
of these areas from the point of view of aging has always been more of a you know, observational rather than interventional area of science. And only recently, I think we're coming to the realization that we actually can do something about aging. And just in general, I think human psyche has always been preconditioned to accept aging as something given and something that it's not even worth bothering about because, I mean, we always, you know, from our birth to maturation to adulthood, always see everybody aging, everybody dying, and we take it as something kind of expected. And, you know, those few that actually start thinking about it and thinking that, you know, this is not cool, they, they are usually ostracized, ostracized and told that, you know, you're just, you're afraid of death and you shouldn't be afraid of it. And uh, because, I mean, for centuries and or for, you know, forever, really, we couldn't really do anything about aging. And it's just like a few decades now that we got the tools in the biology to manipulate genomes, to do something about uh, our biology at such a level that we can re reprogram our genes, reprogram our cells, that we can potentially get into the details of how aging works and hopefully do something about it. So yeah, this is this is a novel paradigm shift in thinking that needs to happen, not just you know in researchers, but in pretty much everybody who is connected to medicine, to, you know, to therapy development, drug development, to policymakers, to governments. And just, the, I mean, this shift is taking place, but it's a very recent shift. It, it, like, even five years ago, this was still a fringe area of research. You would tell people that, you know, you're trying to make everybody live longer and you get like looks from even, you know, medical professionals are like, why, why would you want to do that? And <laughs> what about overpopulation? Like this is the first knee jerk reaction everybody has when we first hear about making people live longer. But anyways, yeah, but it's taking place and like people, when they're actually presented with the idea and have some time to think about it, they realize that there's nothing bad about, you know, living longer and being younger for much longer. And it's just a matter of, can we do it? And so, you know, this, this question is still in the uh, realm of uh, may, uh, maybe answer. I mean, potentially, of course, we can do it. It's just a matter of finding a solution. There's nothing in biology that prevents us from living much longer because we see examples of other mammals living 200 years, other uh, animals living 400 years and even beyond that. So uh, there's no reason why humans couldn't live that longer provided that we, you know, figure out what are the mechanisms that are preventing us from doing so. And uh, yeah, it's just a matter of, you know, finding how to do it. So is that what sort of got you into COVID, just your, your general concern with life preservation? No, no, no? <laughs> absolutely not. Um, oh, okay. What got me into COVID is just uh, my other hobby, which is arguing on social media <laughs> with people. Uh, just, you know, there's That's not a this, good hobby to have. Uh, you know, it works for me. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm joking, half joking about arguing. Ar arguing is not a hobby, but like discussing things. I like to, uh, because there's a lot of, uh, useful things that come out in these discussions and they really mm. can improve your understanding of a topic because I, I think there was a, a meme somewhere uh, like a first photo showing uh, like a dude lying on the couch and just I don't know watching tv and the caption says me uh, preparing for a test for tomorrow and the second caption was the dude looking like in the computer researching 10 different papers and the caption is me trying to prove my point on social media <laughs> so when you're actually like arguing with someone you you do a lot of research and uh, i think even go even deeper than when you actually have to do it because just you're you know studying subject in school or trying to pass a test so like uh, and there's always these topics that come up and are interesting and you start like if there's some unknowns uh, about some new issue, you just start debating, you research it, pick a side, uh, which at least in your opinion 
is mostly supported by the evidence. And in the course of debate, you might switch your position because you get better evidence or to the contrary, or you actually get your position strengthened and you get, you know, it fills out much better. And, you know, it's, it's fun. It's, you know, intellectual workout, essentially. At least that's how I, I, I view it. Um, so, I mean, so that's kind of how I got into uh, COVID origins, like way back last year where it all just broke out. And there were, you know, some people were saying that uh, it was a weird coincidence that this outbreak happened in Wuhan near like the premier lab that uh, deals with this these coronaviruses. And almost immediately, the people who were saying this were labeled as uh, crazy conspiracy theorists. And so, you know, and it, it basically, like to a person who just hears about it for the first time, it does sound like a crazy conspiracy theory. It's like, yeah, you know, usually these things, like new viruses come out all the time. And usually from China, you get all these kind of bird flus and swine flus coming out of China, like for, for many, many times. And you, of course, the first kind of, for, for, for me, reaction was, oh, yeah, this is probably like the first SARS. I still remember the first SARS. I mean, I was in Toronto. I remember like the hospitals getting locked down and uh, it came from China. So you're like, yeah, okay, coronavirus, probably, you know, another animal, you know, source gave us another SARS-like virus. And so, you know, you, again, you start researching it because when, you know, you voice your position on social media, people start giving arguments for or against and some arguments sound kind of plausible and you start digging and you start digging and you're like okay well this is maybe not such a crazy conspiracy theory and then like personally i started digging deeper and deeper and like realized that it's absolutely not crazy at all it's completely plausible there's so many uh, suspicious things about this outbreak so many suspicious things about the genome of of this virus that you know eventually i let it simmer in my head and just you know decided to write a medium article about it and just kind of outline what what my findings were and what i found suspicious and uh, you know the rest is pretty much history so that's how i got into it originally uh, when did you put out that first medium article well, it actually started with the Russian language article, or I, it actually started on Facebook with just, you know, some Facebook posts and Facebook flame wars. And so I started researching uh, papers on coronaviruses, coronavirus research, she's generally what she's been doing. And almost immediately you come across Ralph Barrick and uh, their joint research. And so at first, all of this, I wrote a Russian language essentially like uh, um, the same thing as a medium platform. There's a Russian Hubber platform, which is a Russian language blog slash, you know, uh, long reads, scientific oriented, popular, popular science actually is more, more, more apt uh, description. So yeah, I wrote that in Russian, <laughs> got a lot of criticism, uh, translated it to English, put it up on, uh, on Medium. And I, that I did in like April, uh, like early April, I think I put it on Hubber. And so in late April, I put it up on Medium and Twitter kind of at the same time. So yeah, so I'd say yeah, April of 2020 is uh, when I when I published. Yeah, that's pretty early on. And um, outline like what I mean, the yeah i mean i was surprised that nobody like i was kind of looking for that medium article that i wrote for someone to write something about it on uh, on covid origins but there wasn't anything like this there were like you know little snippets or blog entries about this and that but nowhere was it systemically summarized and links made between what the labs in Wuhan or North Carolina have been doing to understand the global picture of gain of function and why would people be doing this and why would uh, a you know Furin Klevich side appear 
in a virus or why would someone try to splice in a different receptor binding domain into a virus? It basically, was all very little disconnected uh, pieces of the puzzle that uh, essentially like I wanted to bring in uh, into a complete picture myself. And once I did, once it was a complete picture, picture in my mind, I was like, wow, holy mother of God. <laughs> <laughs> is this a PG PG podcast? <laughs> can we swear? Oh yeah, you, you, you can right. fucking fire away. All right, all right, f bombs away. <laughs> so uh, yeah, and so I, I I decided to write it myself, and uh, yeah, just post it. I mean, I I, I kind of like writing things like this uh, once in a while <laughs> when I'm not too lazy, and it, it it actually like some it takes on a life of its own. I I sometimes. Um, liken it to pregnancy like we've you have so many ideas it's like they you know simmer in and until you release them out to the world they they won't let you won't leave you alone and so yeah you have to give birth to it and uh, you know disconnect from it a little bit to then breathe aside of relief and uh, get on with your life because you know if it takes over you're like for me at least like i'm very um I get into like really deep into things and just they interest me. And I'm like, oh my God, I, I got to get to the bottom of this. And until I do and can, you know, uh, let go of it, uh, <laughs> my life is unfortunately dominated by, by this, uh, these things that I get into. So, yeah, I just, that was maybe even a uh, uh, necessity for me to kind of <laughs> be able to disconnect from it although it didn't uh, yeah it didn't definitely not let me go because you know once i posted on twitter there were follow-ups and follow-ups and uh rosana segreto uh found me and we decided to try to join actual scientific paper because one of the criticism that i got was oh this is just a blog post like mm -hmm. first you write a peer-reviewed article then we'll talk to you like from scientists and so we decided you know why not we can we can put it into like more academic format. And that's, and so we did, we wrote actually by now almost, you know, well, we got a third paper coming out now with Rosanna and there might be, I mean, not might be, there will be a fourth one. Fourth one is also in peer review right now. So, so yeah. So this, did, this... did you, did you write then the, the first article and the first paper on this topic then? No, I wouldn't say, I mean, I wrote the first article, like, because I said, even before my, my blog post, before my Medium post, there were blog entries on, oh, right. yeah. you know, little things. So I, I definitely don't want to misrepresent myself. <laughs> I'm, I'm the first one who thought this was a lab leak, <laughs> because really, like, pretty much everybody suspected that this could be a lab leak, starting from Shi Zheng Li. She was probably the first one who thought it could be a lab leak. You know, I think in the Scientific American glamour piece on her, it, it like she says on December 30th, she was in a bullet train back to Wuhan thinking it could have been a lab leak from her lab. So yeah, I mean, I just, yeah, I wrote, uh, I wrote the Medium article and then our paper with Rosanna. No, it was definitely not the first paper because before we published, there was the Sirotkin and Sirotkin paper. That might be the first paper uh, in bioessays as well, uh, and it it actually talks a lot of the things that I talk about in the Medium article about like this potentially being a result of serial passage in this virus being a result of serial passage in animals or genetic engineering, and that genetic engineering doesn't leave any traces, as Ralph Barrick, you know, both said and demonstrated in his papers, and so basically Sorokin is Sorokin paper says a lot of these things, but in the academic paper, peer-reviewed paper format. So I think that, like, if we're looking for the first academic paper, that could be a paper. And then also, before we published, there was a paper almost at the same time came out from Mona and her husband. Uh, I don't want to butcher their last name, but Halikar, I think. I'm, I apologize in advance for uh, mispronouncing their last name. Um, about the Mojiang mine, uh, like the story, backstory about uh, the accident in 2012 that, you know, 
miners, six miners oh. came down with a pneumonia, clearing this mine in Mojiang in Yunnan. And essentially, Wuhan Institute of Virology jumping on this cave and first of all, jumping on the miners and collecting serum from miners, analyzing it for SARS antibodies, noticing like actually getting positive results from testing. So basically, the, the miners were infected with something SARS-like, something that cross-reacted with SARS antibodies. And so Mona and her husband uh, published that paper before ours with Rosanna came out. And I think ours came out in November uh, of 2020 with, uh, yeah. So yeah, and there were you know a lot of preprints, probably the first preprint on a lab leak theory was from China from Zhao Botao, who actually later was kind of forced to retract his, it was just like a two page preprint. And he actually suspected the Wuhan CDC, which mm -hmm. was like 300 meters away from the Hunan, uh, Hunan seafood market. Uh, so he thought maybe there was this guy, Jun Han Tian, I, I forget. I mean, it was so long ago, uh, who was, um, like a, he was a hero of some papers on like people hunt, hunting for viruses. And he was boasting that he got bitten by bats, collecting ticks off of bats, and that he had to quarantine himself for like 14 days, a couple of times because he was suspected they could have been infected. And he worked at the Wuhan CDC and he published a lot of papers on, but he was more into like ticks, bat ticks and, you know, other arthropods. But so, but Tao Zhao thought that maybe, you know, it escaped from Wuhan CDC and had some connection with uh, maybe that guy. But that was like quickly, uh, he was forced to retract that uh, preprint because it was pretty apparent the Chinese government was going to put a very tight lid on this story and control like anything that comes out uh, out of Wuhan, out of China, basically. I think that alone should make someone very suspicious that, you know, if this was really, you know, just a natural occurrence, and the Chinese really didn't know where the hell it came from, there would be, there would like the most interested parties to actually found, find out where it came from and be as transparent and open as possible uh, with any data that they could uh, share with the world, which is pretty much what happened in the case of first SARS. So seeing a very different behavior in this, in this uh, situation, this outbreak kind of makes you even more suspicious that, you know, it could be connected to some technogenic lab leak related uh, uh, stuff. So is there uh, any more likelihood in, in your view that it, it came from the Wuhan Institute of Virology over the, uh, the CDC building? I don't know. I don't want to, like, it's very tough to pinpoint if uh, where it could have come from. And there's so many different possibilities between the two uh, extremes, one being like completely natural, nobody knows where it came from, to like definitely lab leak, they were working on it and, you know, genetically created this virus. There's a whole gamut of other uh, possibilities that maybe they didn't even know they have some like contamination in the lab. Maybe the researchers had it in their, like they were infected with some sort of virus that contaminated something years ago. Maybe they collected it from the mine. It got into lab cultures. It got into animals. There was some, you know, cross uh, or recombination and some researchers caught it, didn't even know they had a coronavirus. They just thought, hmm, I have a flu. You know, they come back and after they uh, recover from it, maybe they infect other people and it just kind of stays localized in the lab and then escapes. Or, and so, or, you know, maybe even through relatives of researchers and nobody in the lab knows what happened. So, yeah, between those uh, different scenarios, it's very hard to, you know, at this point, with not having any information come out of China to, to guess between where it could have come from, if it was a lab leak. Yeah, I, I probably, and it, you know, not really 
doesn't really make a difference where the hell it came from. If it was a lab leak like Wuhan CDC, was it the Wuhan Institute of Virology? But, uh, and like I have, now that we have this preprint in, in the process of hopefully getting it published, I don't know if you've seen it, it was on Twitter uh, um, a month ago, where we analyzed sequencing data sets from, from Wuhan. We looked at agricultural data sets, they were sequencing like rice and cotton, and we noticed that it is contaminated with viral reads. So basically, reads of sequencing reads from somebody sequencing viruses. So it's entirely possible that it leaked from a central sequencing facility where, you know, different labs would send their samples to be sequenced. And I mean, right now, you can't really publish anything without sequencing the genome of whatever you're working on, be it rice or the new virus. So what probably uh, exists or existed or still exists in Wuhan is some central facility for sequencing stuff where you know researchers will, researchers will send their samples to be sequenced. And it's possible that that place maybe didn't have the, the right biosafety level standards, or maybe people even didn't realize, like researchers, before uh, the outbreak, SARS-like viruses were classified as uh, like BSL-2, like biosafety level 2, I think. And SARS itself was biosafety level 3. Like they weren't even BSL-4 level. So it's, it's yeah, it's possible like sequencing, they, they wouldn't take any precautions with those viruses because, I mean, they're supposed to be like completely... Uh, inactivated and even like not even live viruses uh, there sent in, but it's possible that they could have been contaminated with live virus particles if the right safety precautions weren't uh, taken during like packaging of the virus, of the sample to be sent for sequencing. So it's possible that this central sequencing facility was kind of the hotbed of different contamination and maybe like different viruses living in some, I don't know, cultures or somewhere on the maybe surfaces or maybe in the machines uh, that do the sequencing. I mean, it's uh, very hard to understand what exactly could have gone wrong, but it's very mm. alarming that we saw viral contamination in data sets being sequenced that are, you know, are not supposed to, uh, are supposed to be done at a very uh, much lower safety, biosafety standard than viral sequencing is supposed to be done, especially if we're talking about like RNA contamination. And uh, RNA is much uh, more dangerous contamination be than DNA contamination because like sometimes they would sequence a copy of the virus that have, they have an RNA live virus and they make a DNA double strand copy of the virus. Yuri, you froze up. All right, we're 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 back on. We we froze up there. Either hackers or God is mad at us. So yeah, we're we're back. <laughs> all right. Uh, so yeah, so basically all uh, all this kind of very long preamble was that maybe the central sequencing facility in Wuhan is actually the source of uh, the leak, and it could potentially explain why a scientist from the Wuhan Institute of Virology or any, anywhere else might, might be completely honestly saying that they have no idea, uh, like it didn't leak from their lab. And they may be like, even the, the viruses they have are different from the ones that have been kind of breeding in, in those sequencing centers. And so everybody can, with a straight face, say that, you know, it didn't come from my lab. I don't know where it came from. And it could still have been a lab leak out of the sequencing center that nobody really you know, uh, know, knew about. Or right now, even if they know about now, can, you know, they don't have to disclose it right now because you know, the government is probably not, not very keen on uh, releasing anything that could uh, you know, put, put them in, in the situation where they have to admit that it was a lab leak after all. Is, is that kind of what... Xi Jinping seemed to be uh, alluding to a year ago that well, it didn't come from this lab, from my lab. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, from my lab, right? <laughs> yeah, right. I think yeah. Well, 
it's a translated quote, but at least yeah, translation seems to say that she said, I investigated it and I'm, I'm sure it didn't come from my lab. So uh, yeah, one can kind of read into it and say that she opened, she kept the door open from, it could have come from some other lab, but it didn't come from my lab. So yeah. Uh, and, but the, but it, could, it, it could also be the special powers from above, you know, pushing her to, to, to say a certain thing as well. Oh yeah, I'm sure there is. Yeah, there is pressure from you know her uh, bosses, from you know the secret service people in China who are not like I don't know how they called, but mm. the KGB equivalent and used to be in Russia mm-hmm. that are definitely like controlling the narrative and don't want to make sure that nothing you know extra is being released that shouldn't be like information wise probably yeah so it, it from what what i gather from what you're saying is it it might if it came from a lab it's not even necessarily that it was from gain of function research gone awry it could be much more yeah it, it, no, it's not yeah not necessarily i mean it gain of function is a, a potential uh, maybe more likely explanation, but it's definitely not the only explanation in even in the uh, subset of all possible lab leak scenarios. Okay, yeah, it definitely, it definitely could. Yeah, as I said, it could really blend the line between the natural and the lab leak hypothesis that it could have been a lot of the like natural evolution recombination happening, but in the lab, but without people knowing. So it, it, it definitely is possible. But at the same time, they have been doing a lot of gain of function research, you know, splicing in receptor binding domains into different backbones, having many unpublished sequences. Uh, now we know more and more things, you know, again, which they haven't disclosed with uh, the seeker from Twitter, Anonymous, finding the first two uh, PhD and master sorry, thesis. Sorry, who, who, who's, who's this, the seeker? The seeker is some random, not some random, some anonymous hmm. Indian dude, a filmmaker, I, apparently. Like, I, I found that out myself from, uh, there was a piece, I forget the, the, the author, but basically there's a piece on the, the Mojiang mind story and how the seeker found this, this master's thesis and the PhD thesis, the Chinese language thesis is that... Uh, uh, essentially disclosed in very uh, good detail what happened in the Mojiang mine. They had all each miner's medical uh, history in the hospital. They had x-rays. They had uh, results of tests, the SARS antibody results, and that the, what role that Wuhan Institute of Virology played in, in all of that uh, uh, investigation of those miners. So basically, until the, that was publicized, uh, neither Xi Jinping nor Wuhan Institute of Virology acknowledged even that the virus came from, from the Mojiang mine. I mean, the RATG uh, virus came from that mine or that they even sequenced it as far back as 2017 because it seemed that they seemed to imply that this, they sequenced this newly released RATG 13 strain only in 2020 after the epidemic, after they kind of ma- matched the SARS-2 fragment to a very short fragment of RATG. Uh, but apparently they actually had the whole sequence of RATG in their possession. So it's very weird. Why didn't they just said, you know, they could have matched the full genome of SARS-2 to the full genome of RATG-13 and they would see that it's 96% equivalent. They don't need it, didn't need to look at any short fragments. So it's very weird. It seemed like initially they were trying to release as, as little information as possible and see what the result will be in, in the greater community. Basically, can we get away with this? Okay, we got away with this. Let, let's release a little more if you know they, they discover something more. Oh, they discovered that we had this from the Mojiang mine. Okay, we'll, we'll tell them that it, it came from Mojiang mine. Oh, they discovered that we sequenced it in 2018 because we're stupid enough to put the file names with the actual year up on uh, GenBank. And uh, after that only, after we're like, oh wait, why does the file name, the sequencing raw data says the file name has 2017 and 2018 in it? 
Does that mean that's when it was sequenced? And they're like, oh yeah, yeah, we sequenced it as far back as 2018 in Wuhan. Like, okay, why didn't you tell that in your paper that you actually sequenced it as far back as 2018? And why did you have to say that uh, you only discovered or you only decided to sequence it after you match the short, short fragment, or at least you seem to imply that in your paper. Why? So yeah, anyways. Um, but basically, coming back to the seeker, the seeker now released uh, three more. He found three more theses. I think, it, I mean, Latin would be theses. But anyway, um, he released three more Chinese language theses uh, from uh, uh, Wuhan Institute of Virology this time. And the, they, uh, all of them reference uh, RATG 13, but actually it was still named 4991 back then. So it, it, again, it's a very weird thing for them to do to rename a, a, a virus sequence or sample uh, from like its original name. They just used RATG 13 without any reference to the original name in their nature paper, which is you know, a complete you know, unheard of thing in academia. Usually you want to be as uh, certain as possible to the, all the previous history of your discoveries. Essentially, if, especially if it's your discoveries, it's your papers you're citing, you're you know, increasing your Hirsch score. But uh, for some reason, they chose not to even uh, cite their own paper on where they got this strain of our ATG-13. And, uh, and why they renamed 4991 to our ATG-13, where in all of these theses, it's still referenced as 4991. Why did they have to read? And the latest thesis is from 2019, and it's still named uh, RA4991, and it's a full genome. They, in that thesis, they actually say that, yeah, yeah, we have a full genome. Uh, and I think even in 2017, they had a full genome paper released, I mean, thesis released in 2017. So they, they must have had a full sequence even before 2017 of 4991 because they're comparing like two different genes to several genes and they actually have the actually have the uh, nucleotides in in the thesis in like a, one of the tables so yeah like a lot of the questions what why why you know they're being so like not even non-transparent they're be, being very uh, i would say misleading even with the data they release and how they release it and like it's uh, so far from the whole truth that we're getting we're getting like a sliver of truth and they, they still have a lot of unpublished sequences uh that they reference in those theses uh but uh they still haven't made them public or put them up on uh, yeah on like on gene bank or anywhere else so just, so just I, to, I think I've gotten like on tenth tangent by now. I didn't even remember what the original <laughs> question. Eleventh. <11th. laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, we'll go but up just, to eleven. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Your tangents go to eleven. Yeah. Yeah. My uh, um, just just to try to contrast this all. Um, so what was, so what was uh, being what what information was coming out uh, of China during. SARS 1.0 uh, back in 03, uh, just to sort of compare with, you know, what, how, you know, cryptic a lot of this is that is going on now and, and how little is being released at this point in time. Like what was sort of the cooperation between, uh, with, with China and the rest of the world? And if I remember correctly, I think the outbreaks were only like in what, Toronto, Hong Kong and China? Yeah, I mean, uh, there was, I think there was something in Singapore uh, mm -hmm. as well. But yeah, it was pretty localized. And it, I guess the first outbreak was in China in uh, the Guangdong province. And they very quickly narrowed it down to these palm civets that were like sold in, in the markets. And uh, uh, yeah, they, they like welcomed, uh, you know, international help and they were pretty transparent in providing all of the data, all the samples, they sampled, you know, all the animals that were being sold. And uh, yeah, I mean, pretty quickly, like in a matter of weeks, I think they narrowed it down to those animals. 
And uh, yeah, but in this case, now we don't even have like over a year after we still don't have any zoonotic source, any animal that, you know, we could pin this down on that it could have given it to, to humans. Uh, yeah, so um, I mean, I, I I wasn't there <laughs> in 2002, <laughs> but just judging by the literature, uh, like from what I've seen, uh, it was pretty open cooperation between like Chinese scientists and, and Western scientists. So and there wasn't any you know uh, limits put on information release. Nobody was complaining that you know something is being kept under wraps completely in opposition to what is happening today. So it's very, uh, very different. I guess an important uh, SARS-1 question. So in, in Toronto, did you get to go to the Rolling Stones concert after? No, I oh. didn't. I <laughs> didn't, but uh, I think my ex-wife did. Like it was, uh, but there, there, yeah, uh, there was a big, yeah. Why did you bring it up? Oh, just just curious, random question. Oh, yeah, yeah, uh, that, because yeah, there were there was SARS in Toronto, and then there was the SARS stock concert to try to recover everything. And so uh, I was just wondering that that would seem like a cool thing to go to. Yeah, I mean, uh, but it wasn't really like a huge deal even back then. I, I, the The only thing they locked down was hospitals. You, you were supposed to just. The, like if you come in you have to wear a mask or you weren't even like allowed in if you were visiting someone but like life in anywhere else was uninhibited like nothing different like far cry from the lockdowns of today back then it was a much lower transmissibility of the SARS-1 virus and the uh, symptoms presented this uh, much quicker that like Right now, this SARS-2 is so sneaky, you, you could be shedding it without even knowing it. And only like later, you actually feel bad and start getting a fever. And this is kind of the, I think, the recipe for success for the virus is that it, it can be so cryptic. But yeah, SARS-1 in, in comparison was much less adapted to humans. Uh, of, yeah, like, and in the course of evolution of it, to 2003 even in like a very small number of people compared to because it was just thousands of people i think it's under 10,000 people in total who ever had sars-1 infection so even in such a small population sample we see a lot of the variants emerging and with significant mutation that increase transmissibility that you know basically showing that this virus is not a human virus. It's not well adapted to humans. In contrast to SARS-2, which was very well adapted right from the get-go. And, and again, I mean, this is not my original observation. A lot of people have been writing about this. I think Alina Chan and her co-authors mm. might be the first ones to you know, put out a preprint about this you know, very curious high adaptability of the SARS-2 virus in contrast to the SARS-1 virus. So yeah, but it's again, it's one of those like dozens of very suspicious facts about this virus that weighs heavily on the lab leak hypothesis, you know, side of the scale. Uh, to jump gears now, um, were you really uh, first outline like what the reaction was was like when you first started talking about this and writing about this, and were you at all surprised with? The, the huge amount of backlash that you got and and some of it you know not not very kind yeah i mean definitely i was surprised because i like initially as i mentioned i posted the russian article and i had like a lot of discussion on the russian uh facebook uh pages with the russian scientists uh and uh, most of them were very negative like they they said like this is crap you're just you know uh, promoting crazy conspiracy theory, theories. There's like no basis for us to think this could have been a lab leak. And and it seemed that they don't even, haven't even read what I wrote. They just maybe just scrolled through it. And I mean, I don't blame them. It's, it's really long. But uh, it's just interesting that a lot of them, and they didn't really have good arguments. They just attacked me 
ad hominem, like they would, I don't know, question my qualification, just question my sanity, <laughs> but not address the, the points. And uh, when I would ask them, so like, you don't find it suspicious that the outbreak happened in Wuhan? They would reveal that they're completely clueless. They would say, no, I don't find it suspicious. That's why they put the Wuhan Institute of Virology there, because they have bats there. I'm like, no, those bats live a thousand miles away. Did you even like do your basic research? Or like scientists would tell me, oh, if genome was modified, we would see traces of human modifications because I worked with genomes and we'd have restriction sites left in them. I'm like, okay, when was the last time you worked with genomes? And she's like, 20 years ago. I'm like, okay, you know, you, you really should catch up on the, you know, wonderful genetic engineering tools that Ralph Barrick published that they can do seamless ligation back in 2000. And yeah, like people, like they, for some reason they would think that they're just so much more qualified than me to make their claims. They don't even need to examine the evidence. They don't, don't even need to examine the arguments. They just by the sheer weight of their regalia, they can say, I looked at the genome. It doesn't look genetically modified to me. Therefore, it must be natural. Like, and these are like big, you know, respected scientists saying these completely you know, logic 101 errors, things, you know, like, no, absence of evidence does not mean evidence of, mm. I mean, yeah, yeah. <laughs> evidence of you, absence. You said it right. Just yeah. because you don't see that, you know, uh, there's no obvious signs of human manipulation doesn't mean it wasn't manipulated by humans. And so I, you know, initially it wasn't even like, I wasn't arguing that lab leak is the more likely hypothesis. I was arguing that lab leak is like not even plausible, it's possible. Like you shouldn't just dismiss it out of hand because that's what they were doing initially. Like my whole article is about like give live lab leak a chance because uh, yeah, it was deemed a conspiracy theory from the start. And like, and I twice myself wasn't convinced it was a lab leak, like actually far from it. I thought initially back in April, I thought, Lab leak is possible, but still less likely than, you know, natural occurrence, natural outbreak, just because, you know, we didn't have uh, enough data and, uh, you know, lab leaks do happen, but, you know, most of the time it's actually natural outbreaks. Of course, now, a year later, and so many new things that we learned, I think lab leak is by far the more uh, likely explanation than uh, anything natural. And what has weighed down heavily is also the all of the like things surrounding the situation, like the political and the behavioral, how how people were behaving, I think reveals much more than genomes can reveal ever. So uh, I, I, I think it's just uh, like right now, uh, it's in, to my mind, I put it at like 90% probability that it's a lab leak versus... 10% the uh, completely natural. Now on, on Russia, like there, there's all these really, some of them really dumb and, and really weird hardline political stances that people would take in, in North America against lab leak. But what, what was causing people to be so dismissive in Russia? I think it's just groupthink, like anywhere else. Uh, you get like a couple of like big names saying it's not, uh, it's crazy conspiracy theory. And you get all of the people under them in the hierarchy of like the cool scientists or the respected scientists. They don't want to break ranks and they want, I don't know, maybe to look better or, you know, and so they just fall in line and just, you know, hear the attack call and just go on attacking and um, I don't know and just yeah they, they just become very vocal and basically also like once someone establishes a position it's very hard for them to yeah. reverse that position without losing face and so I think a lot of people even subconsciously will just keep pressing their case uh, you know without uh, you know giving it uh, 
not even a second thought, but like without even wanting to to examine evidence of, of the contrary. I mean, uh, there are also very you know normal scientists engaging in reasonable debate with me in on reasonable like not ad hominem levels. The publishing papers like Punchin and Tishkovsky, they published a comment uh, which I mean I think is completely wrong and we have addressed it with Rosana and will uh, hopefully will pass peer review and get published you know in the, in the next few weeks but I mean I welcome scientific uh, debate and uh, you know they point out any potential weak spots in our arguments we counter that you know their arguments are wrong and it, it's completely normal uh, and finally finally this is actually what was happening more on on like Twitter and the English speaking uh, sphere of, of debates. I think it was more kind of science based until people started blocking each other. Uh, there was like, the, it starts as a scientific debate and then you get uh, like other people come in uh, from both camps and start attacking uh, the original people, like the scientists who were debating and this uh, scientists probably like get a little frustrated and they just start blocking everybody. They don't want to be engaged into like Twitter wars. But uh, I mean, I, I think uh, generally the, uh, the level of personal attacks was much lower on the English speaking side of the debate than on the Russian side of the deba debate, maybe just because, you know, Russians are much less uh, nicer or just don't know how to <laughs> behave themselves, especially like online, they'll just be very nasty in, in their personal personal attacks. They can just separate someone having a differing opinion from someone being an idiot. And uh, they think it's, you know, it has to be connected. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, even though <laughs> Christian Anderson and who else, Peter Daszak, have been blocked. Uh, uh, oh, Christian Anderson with... blocked you? Oh yeah, he blocked me a while back. Oh. Or Eddie Eddie Holmes when I when I said his alignment of uh, RM102 is wrong, Eddie blocked me. I mean, Christian stayed with me, uh, like debating me for a while. But I think it's one point I said their alignments are laughable and he blocked me. <laughs> I guess there's a certain level of criticism that they could take. Uh, and you don't know, like Twitter, I mean, Twitter is very heterogeneous with the level of uh, sarcasm or you know, making fun of people. Like it's one to one person is totally cool to like say, I don't know, your alignments are bogus. Like, what are you, what are you thinking? aligning it like that uh, and with other person then take it very personally and just will block you but uh i mean christian's been very uh, reasonable in, in uh, any scientific debate although again he could like say oh you know you don't know what you're talking about you don't have a degree you need to read a virology textbook written by eddie eddie holmes and i'm like but eddie can't align a genome look here are the nucleotides um but Angela, Angela Rasmussen, who actually blocked me preemptively, is probably a good example of like what Russian debate looked like, because she was all at hominem like from the beginning. Uh, I didn't even know who she was until I was pointed out by like some people like that she compared my Medium article to some neo-Nazi book. And maybe be, <sighs> that's because she's married to a Russian dude. <laughs> it's just the Russianness rubbing off on her and being nasty in debates and it's a funny no she, 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 she's just in that case yeah i don't know <laughs> I, I i mean uh as, as much as i uh disagree with her tactics and think she owes us rosana and i an apology and just the way that she behaved is bad i i don't feel like nasty feelings towards her and i think you know she's just this is just like that it's a person probably was getting away with it before but like maybe twitter is just not uh not a very forgiving platform for having lapses in judgment and like you know you, you want to call someone an idiot or hurt themselves and you you write that their their medium piece is racist and uh, then you cool off and you're like okay i probably shouldn't have said that but you know it's there it's screenshot and like you can't get rid of it off of, off of the internet 
anyways enough about angie she's yeah, yeah. she's now your neighbor yeah i, I know Saskatchewan. I, I i'm i haven't recovered from the depression yet it's <laughs> you it's should go burn, visit it's burning and say, I, I know we'll, we'll go for a walk by the, the Saskatchewan says, huh? river <laughs> yeah <laughs> i'm sure i could say hi on behalf of a lot of people to her so. yeah she has a lot of friends <laughs> yeah yeah she, she blocked she has a made along the way with her uh yeah with her journey of yeah, her, uh, her, journey of inflammatory comments absolutely yeah that's a mild way to put it we're still yeah. staying on the pg side of things <laughs> <laughs> anyway uh back back to to christian anderson so did he have any actual sort of uh retort to your claims or was it just that you don't have the qualifications so shut up and go away i mean we didn't really get to debate many issues at depth but like one issue he did engage me debating in was the alignment of rm wild and o2 to its uh, relatives where initially eddie and others have claimed that there's an insertion near the where sars2 has a furin cleavage site insertion prra they think that rm wild and o2 has a insertion at the same spot which they think is evidence of the natural origin of this insertion in SARS-2 because they say, look, you know, this, this insertion can happen in other viruses as well. But, you know, when I looked at this, when we looked at this insertion with Rasana, we saw that, I mean, it's not just an insertion, it actually is preceded by a deletion, which is actually larger than insertion, they, that the insertion, larger than the insertion. So it doesn't, it kind of makes sense because I mean, uh, or at least we should we should have seen genomes with either one or the other before seeing both. Basically, what is more uh, parsimonious is not to have a deletion and an insertion, but just basically these are point mutations in like the rel in RM one RM one o two compared to its relative strains. It just doesn't. You know, insertion is much less likely than mutations, point mutations. And so, I mean, we said as much in our first paper, kind of in passing, like, we're like, oh, but, you know, if this was an insertion, we would expect the RM102 to exhibit this insertion when compared to its nearest relatives. We did pairwise comparison, you know, no algorithm points in insertion here, you know, Eddie, you're incorrect. And then... Christian, kind of on behalf of Eddie on Twitter, uh, said, started basically a thread saying that we're wrong. Uh, you know, we need to use multiple alignments, and only then we'd see an insertion. And we started debating it, and then we did do multiple alignments. We showed that even in multiple alignment algorithms, we do not see an insertion. We just, you know, they either have essentially align it without an insertion. Or if you actually look at it with your trained eye and match the nucleotides between many strains and see what could have happened during the course of evolution, you even more uh, certain to see a pattern of point mutations, or at least, you know, I and Rosanna are. And so when we pointed it out, basically it all kind of disintegrated in the debate that you know, uh, Christian saying, I've been aligning genomes longer than, you know, you could walk. I'm paraphrasing. And, uh, you know, so has Eddie. And basically, we know what we're doing and you don't. So just, you know, and th that, that was. And then he just stopped uh, engaging in any kind of uh, debate, uh, but, you know, didn't block me yet. And then after, you know, another tweet when I said, like, oh, your alignments are laughable. I think to Eddie or maybe to both of them. Uh, I yeah, to both of them because it was in reaction to their uh, virological.org post on something, some, I don't remember what, but they used the alignments, the same alignments with the same insertion to claim that uh, the insertion in SARS-2 must be natural or not must be, but is more likely to be natural because they see the same insertion in uh, other strains. So now, that's that's the story on Christian and I. Uh, um, now outline uh, what uh, Peter, <clears throat> sorry, what Peter Daszak's position has been, and, and if it has uh, changed at all over the course of the past year. 
Mm, I don't think it's changed. I mean, <laughs> Peter's been the orchestrator of the whole PR dirt slinging campaign on lab leak hypothesis from the beginning. I mean, you see emails back in February of 2020 of Peter trying to orchestrate this big letter in support of scientists, which essentially is just you know, a letter to label uh, the leap, uh, lab leak hypothesis as a crazy conspiracy theory. And you see Christian Anderson like jumping on this idea that you know he'll uh, he'll defend that you know it's a natural zoonosis, which is crazy. You know how do you know in February of 2020 of a outbreak that happened just a couple of months ago that it's natural without any evidence of that at all? I, like it seemed that Christian was just trying to you know be a, a good sport and uh, kind of take one for the team and support the like the boss Peter Dash not the boss but like you know the big the, guy the big guy yes yeah. the, the the godfather <laughs> <laughs> of uh, the bad father let's name him <laughs> 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 to support him in this kind of attack or to quelling these rumors uh, that could put shade on the good virologists or you know, jeopardize their funding sources or gain of function research that could, like, if this really proves to be a lab leak, I think they stand to lose the most. Uh, both EcoHealth, Peter Dash, like virologists like Christian Anderson, people who've been involved in, in that kind of research and uh, been living off of grants, who, you know, dependent on grants to fund this kind of research. Just but yeah, I mean, I haven't been following Peter that you know closely, but his position hasn't changed at all. He's and I think he was losing it just a couple of days back because of the letter in Science that mm. Ralph Barrick has signed, saying that you know both leak hypothesis and natural hypothesis have equal like right now should be examined as e equal equally plausible hypothesis and peter just i think lost it on twitter just went off and that you know this is uh, not the right thing to say so i, I think his i mean uh, i don't see his position changing at all because again his livelihood and career depend on this not being a lab leak so yeah we'll, we'll come back to that uh letter that came out in science just what was that two days ago now yeah two or three something like that yeah 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 so do um do you see that if this is never really resolved and there's nothing ever really conclusive about the origins of, of SARS-CoV-2 which seems at this point really possible that it might just be you know a very 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 long-term mystery um unless I'm missing something could you see uh, Peter Daszak and anybody else involved in gain-of-function research really doubling down on their initiative and saying that, well, look at how bad this this, this whole pandemic was. Look, look how many people died from this. We need more gain-of-function research. You know, we're, we're going to keep trying to, you know, predict randomness and just keep, <laughs> <laughs> which works out well every time. Yeah. <laughs> so we're, we're, let, let's keep going with with more gain of function research do you see that as an in, entirely possible for for their own vested interest yeah absolutely i see that possible as them using it as a, you know as an excuse to get more funding but i also see more and more reasonable people in charge of funding saying they're full of shit because as you rightfully pointed out trying to predict randomness of what the next virus will jump out of the jungle is completely stupid because we can't even predict the weather two weeks out. Like, how are you going to predict, you know, what's not even like what kind of strain of the virus will jump on, but just in general. So this whole idea that we're going to stay ahead of the, of the viruses by actually going into the jungle and sampling them and bringing them back into Wuhan or any other city with millions of people is dumb is like so completely utterly dumb that i don't know how anybody gave them grants for that like like you have to be really and i, I don't know maybe anthony fauci convinced them that you know this is the way to the pan coronavirus vaccine 
to actually go out there and sample the possible viruses and then we'll create something that can really withstand uh, or protect from any variation of the coronavirus. I don't know how, but really like the idea that this is, uh, this is less risky than just leaving it the hell alone, like to me, uh, it's uh, mind boggling. But uh, yeah, I mean, like once, once this gains a foothold in the brains of the funding people that, okay, yeah, biodefense, biopreparedness, you know, we're going to reap benefits for like preventing pandemics. Uh, you know, it just becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy of people, you know, living off of these, you know, very lucrative grants. And basically we don't, they don't have to invent anything or do anything. It's just like a very, a simple thing, you know, get a, you get a grant, you go out to the jungle, you sample some viruses, you modify them, you write a paper, and you can do that like decade after decade going to conferences and having a very nice lifestyle. And oh, oops, you know, we couldn't, we didn't create a pan coronavirus vaccine. We didn't create a pan influenza vaccine. Sorry, but you know, we got sure a lot of paper papers published and i mean nobody expected that you know the these exercises in uh, virus collecting expeditions can potentially for some reason i don't know why they didn't think it could but it definitely like they didn't cross their mind that this is actually probably dangerous you know getting all these sorts of new viruses out and you know getting them into labs with humans and potentially like uh, students who might circ not circumvent, but like not properly do safety procedures or just in general accidents happen with even like the best protections, you know, vials break, centrifuges break, exhaust clearance systems fail, air can get out, water can get out, waste can get out, you know, infected animal can run out. So many things can go wrong. It's just like, but once you have this huge machine, grant feeding, eating machine, where, you know, it has to intake new and new viruses, how are you going to stop it? I mean, thousands of people uh, depend on this machine keeping working. But of course, like if you're like one of the top regulators having to reconsider this, the simplest question you ask is, so how many pandemics did you prevent? How many vaccines did you create? Why didn't you, you know, you were doing this coronavirus research for, I don't know, a decade or two. Why don't we have anything? No, like, drug, nothing at all that can stop coronaviruses. No antivirals, no vaccine, like, even close. Uh, we, you know, you guys weren't prepared. So all this funding that you said is needed for preparedness didn't, didn't do a damn thing. So, I mean... Uh, the, the question of whether we need to continue funding this type of research of, you know, going out and looking for new viruses. I think the, the very simple answer looking at, you know, the, the past track record of uh, EcoHealth or, you know, any other uh, f funding uh, recipient is a very simple no. So at what point would you have seen that a lot of the the taboo and stigma around this whole uh, topic started to shift because uh, we can mention the letter that came out in science two days ago, but it seemed like maybe two months ago it started to lift and people started, you know, notable figures started to talk about it more that, yeah, this is, uh, you know, it, it could have come from a lab. You know, this is a possibility that we, we could take into consideration but it, like it wasn't even that long prior that it was still completely taboo. Like there was the notable appearance of Heather Hying and Brett Weinstein on Bill Maher's show. And they, they talked about it there. And it was just a, you know, a tsunami of outrage from, <laughs> from them, from them discussing that, that, that topic that, Oh, you know, they're, they're going on this big television show and spreading conspiracy theories. And now all of a sudden it's like, Oh, well, you know, <laughs> could come from a lab you know this is a perfectly reasonable thing yeah, so yeah. so like uh, how how did you observe this this ridiculous taboo maintain itself from you know when you started on it in april all the way till you know at least february of this year 
And when did you start to observe it, it sort of lift a bit? Well, I, I think it was just a gradual process with more and more, well, first of all, academic papers came, coming out and journalists then taking it more seriously or writing pieces like in de detail pieces about either the papers or the whole story and giving it a uh, at least uh, as much a neutral uh, view as possible, neutral analysis of both possibilities. And it's just, I think it's just a matter of uh, little by little, it's become more and more acceptable. And there were like quantum jumps from quantum leaps, I guess, from one uh, kind of level to the other after some big name person would come out in support of not even the lab league, but just giving equal merit to either possibility. So yeah, absolutely the uh, uh, Brett and Heather going on Bill Maher's show. Before that, maybe Brett going on Joe Rogan's show, Jamie Metzl, definitely mm -hmm. like his uh, articles and appearances and different uh, news media uh, programs. I think one of the probably a, a, a big impact was from Nicholson's Baker, Nicholson Baker's article in New York Magazine. Uh, I mm. think that was a, a very big explosion at the time. I think it a little subsided, like the level of acceptance subsided afterwards. Uh, and yeah, recently, Nichols Wade's article probably. And so you get like those little explosions that kind of move it, move it, move it forward, the level of acceptance or mainstreamness of uh, being able to talk about the lab leak hypothesis. And yeah, now I think with kind of Ralph Barry coming out and endorsing it, uh, that, you know, it has to be given equal merit. Uh, you see all the like, you know, uh, mainstream scientists like Angie, Christian Anderson, uh, uh, Stephen Gold, Goldstein, Definitely soft, soft, it, it not embracing that it's possible, but at least definitely softening their stance on they don't say it's a crazy conspiracy theory anymore because you know, that would mean that Ralph Barrick is a crazy conspiracy theorist. And uh, I think they, they are willing and, to. And, <laughs> and, and, and a lot of other people who sign up. Like uh, yeah. Uh, Mark, 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 Mark Lipstitch. Right. And also, definitely a lot of the pressure coming from the politicians and like the Senate and uh, them, you know, uh, uh, having a hearing with Fauci and uh, Rand Paul questioning him. Oh, I don't want I don't to get into American politics. It's uh, yeah, dreadful. Uh, yeah. And yeah, but basically, I think that the biggest reason that a lab leak hypothesis has been so fringe, it was because Donald Trump has embraced it early on. And this turned away like half the people because nothing Trump says is ever, you know, can be a good or right thing for, you know, the liberal mm -hmm. part of America. And, uh, but now like the Trump is out in uh, Trump is out, Biden administration is now looking into it and people are like, okay, it must not be like the crazy Trump thing might, might not have, you know, must have some merit to it basically. And so, yeah, like these little things coming in and, uh, gradually turning this discourse into something more acceptable to the mainstream public. Yeah, I, I think that might have had something to do with it. Once the, the orange goblin left the office and, and, and Biden came in, then, for you know, by whatever sort of magical voodoo. Like people... You just lost half of your audience yeah. <laughs> calling him <laughs> orange goblin. <laughs> Well, I, I think I lose a lot of an audience, you know, uh, along the lines from the left and the right, because I, I just I, I don't give a shit about anybody's hardline dogmatic political presuppositions. I just sorry, folks. I, yeah, I don't care about your, I, don't, I don't care about your political heroes. It's too bad. But they, I, I think once he left, then people like by some sort of magic, uh, as I was saying, um, uh, felt like they could they could talk about it then, but it, you know it was it was really e extreme before, and and it's unfortunate too because yeah you know, Trump and I think Steve Bannon early on, but definitely Steve Bannon later on, was saying like oh you know lab leak because Steve Bannon is always just trying to find 
you know, something, everything comes back to China in, 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 <laughs> in, in, in his brain. And so, yeah, he was coming up with this for all the most horrid reasons. But then just to dismiss anybody else who's talking about it with completely different reasons, such as yourself, is, is insane. And, you know, I, I think a, a lot of the people that uh, came after people like you over the course of the, the past year should, you know, hat in hand and, and, and should admit that, you know, they're, they're being re- really unfair. Is that going to happen? No. <laughs> I, don't, I don't care. Yeah, 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 <laughs> the, yeah. the only apology I would like is from Angie Rasmussen. And uh, not, I mean, at least uh, not even maybe an apology, but a retraction of the some bad things she has said about me and Rosanna. Just because they're like so completely untrue about like having any sinophobic undertones or statements. I think she said it's rife with sinophobia is the quote that she said my Medium article has. And this is just like so stupid because I mean, growing up in Toronto and just having so many Asian friends and I, I, I had, a you know, I'm not going to get into my personal life, but mm-hmm. like, like sinophobic is like a crazy accusation for, for me and nobody in their right mind. If they read the damn article will find anything sinophobic. Half of it is dedicated to Ralph Barrick and, it's i think it's a very favorable portrayal of you know him and i don't know xi jenli the research i mean it's definitely very cool from just the research side of things and and i don't see any negativity at all even just not even like asians but just the scientists that i'm writing about i'm not negative about the note so i don't see where she would find anything even like negative about the characters of the article, let alone just the whole ethnicity. Like, it's like why would you say such a thing? I mean, it's insane. Yeah. So. Uh, well, and, and there, there was other conflations of that sort that's has gone on. Like people would have concerns about the, the, the Chinese Communist Party, as I, people should. And, you know, somehow that means that you don't like Chinese people. Which yeah, exactly. Is, which like, is just, for... like, deranged. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's great defense for the CCP. They label anybody saying bad things about the CCP as li- saying bad things about Chinese people. Or like well, when they, you say they, China, they say, and you, when you say China and you mean like the Chinese government and like, oh, you don't like Chinese people. Like, no, Chinese people are fine. I love Chinese people. It's just CCP that I'm having issues with covering things up. And even like, and not like CCP is not the devil. They have good things. They've done a lot of like good things for the environment, although they do a lot of bad things. Like any government, Russian government does a lot of stupid things. They do some good things, like American, Canadian government. Right. I don't leave the politics out of it. Nobody, like, this is not, I don't really want to get into the political stuff. I want to get into, like, this particular thing. If there was a lab leak, you guys are covering it up. Not cool, you know? If, uh, and even like you, you, the question that you've asked a couple of questions ago, like, are we ever going to know? Mm-hmm. Maybe we've not. Yeah. Like, like at this point, probably like not, nobody in the right mind in the government would admit to it because they have nothing to gain from doing so. Like if they admit it was a lab leak, like all of the bad things will happen. If they keep admitting, if they keep saying or keep not admitting it, like what's the worst that can happen? It will eventually kind of die down and maybe the scientific consensus will be that, yeah, most likely it's a lab leak. Like in the case of the 1977 flu pandemic, the scientific consensus now that like 99.9% is sure that was a lab leak. Probably like there's no proof. Like there's no lab records and they're not even sure, was it a Chinese lab? Was it a Soviet lab that, you know, was working on a flu vaccine? Because it's very likely a flu vaccine because it was a temperature sensitive strain and temperature sensitive attenuation is something that, you know, back then was a technology to to create vaccines. But yeah, again, like no, no proof. And uh, like, what's like, there's no political benefit right now in anybody coming out in uh, Russia and saying, yeah, it was us or even China saying like, so it will just you know, remain a essentially academic curiosity or a popular science curiosity to 
know where it could have come from. And most likely, if things keep progressing as they do right now, and in the absence of some like incontrovertible evidence either to the natural jump, they'll find the animal and it was hiding in the sewers of Wuhan, <laughs> or the other way, like, I don't know, if there's a whistleblower, a real whistleblower, because I don't know, like Steve Bannon's Li Ming Yang. I don't know. Some something is odd about her narrative. So they find the whistleblower and they're like, yeah, yeah, this is the genome, and we have like three more. This is the backbone. We splice it in here. And I don't know, these are like the nucleotides that we usually change that to signify that this is our uh geno genom genetic engineering. And then we'll be like, okay, yeah, the lab leak, you know, we know for sure. But in the absence of that, in the absence of like things going like they do right now, it'll probably just you know kind of die down, and eventually people examining from you know the standpoint of five years from now, saying like, yeah, there's zero evidence of natural uh, escape, but all of this weight of circumstantial evidence over lab leak, so probably it was some sort of lab leak. Okay, and yeah, people will forget about it. And I mean, really, uh, like the origins right now is probably less of a concern than trying to stamp this thing out. And like, I'm, I'm hearing a lot of crazy talk about like, let's not get vaccinated. And I'm, 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 I'm horrified because like vaccines are the only thing that can help us on a worldwide scale to stamp this thing out, to completely eradicate it and not have to live in the state of like recurring lockdowns and resurges and new spikes, new variants. And uh, yeah, I mean, and to hear like so much opposition to vaccines, uh, like for me, that, that's the biggest problem. Like forget about the origins. Yeah, it's interesting, but it's not like the problem. The problem is trying to get that out as fast as possible. And to do that, I think the United States needs to like step up and just manufacture enough vaccine for the for the entire world. And they can do this. I mean, they already have like hundreds of millions of doses. And with mRNA vaccines, they're very scalable. Like you can just manufacture billions of doses very quickly. And I, I mean, I love mRNA technology. And it's a new technology. People are scared of it, but it, it's very nice. You can get very precise genetic uh, payloads delivered quickly manufactured quickly, tested quickly, you know, it's it's very pure. It's not like you're, you know, using adenovirus to deliver it or any other kind of virus where you have a lot of other kind of overhead and problems that this virus can cause. This is just like pure mRNA encapsulated in the fat and it can get it yourselves. And uh, basically, you know, definitely we need to do clinical studies to make sure it's safe. But, you know, phase one demonstrated it was safe. You know, phase two, phase three demonstrated it's efficacious. We get people with much lower risk of uh, contracting COVID after vaccination. Yeah, there's a definitely a period of, you know, uh, once they get the vaccine until they're protected, uh, two, three weeks, four weeks, and definitely probably like uh, two shots are better than, uh, than one. So yeah, there's a, a period of time where you shouldn't feel uh, a foul sense of security just because you got a jab. You know, you need to wait it out and you need to still, you know, do all the safety precautions for until you get full immunity. But like the, the vaccines are the only chance the world has to eradicate this, because otherwise, if we, you know, if we if we don't use vaccines and kind of rely on natural immunity, yeah, we'll get natural immunity maybe uh, in, you know, a couple of years once, you know, not... 150 million have been contracted contracted worldwide, but I don't know, a couple of billion contracted worldwide. But we'll get it at the price of millions of dead people. And also we'll give the virus that much more, much more time to develop new mutations. Mm -hmm. And that many more people to do this in, because you know, these are the two main ingredients for new variants to arise. Whereas if we quickly stamp it out, like if we quickly vaccinate people, will prevent the virus from having new labs to experiment in. Because I mean, these, these are the places where mutations happen. If we limit the number of places where mutations can happen, we greatly reduce the chances of the virus finding some novel mutations, good mutations that can give it some kind of advantage. And of course, time-wise as well, like if we wait two years, you know, it's much, much more, many more opportunities for the virus to develop new variants, then if we vaccinate everybody in the next 
say four to five months and essentially will limit this window of opportunity for the virus to develop new mutations that much more greatly. And even if we need to do like another booster round, like we new variants emerge that completely circumvent the existing immunity. Yeah, we can do like another round of vaccines and it won't take us, uh, you know, a year to do so. It'll probably take uh, a few months from like the stage of uh, identifying what new spike to put in the vaccine to the actual phase one, phase two and approval. So that again, will be much more ahead of the virus, even with the new mutation. And we might not even have to do so. But uh, anyways, I'm, I'm getting <laughs> fired yeah, up on, the, about the, this topic. Well, that, that should re really be like the, the major goal, the consolidated international goal is Absolutely. Stamp, stamp out all transmission as soon as possible with all means and including like getting tons of vaccines out there. It, yeah, it, yeah. And it's it it's not looking that great in that department either. But I, I got to let you go right away here, Yuri. Yeah, um, but, yeah. before, but before you take off, um, I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts as to if there might be any more um, it, or if it's if it's possible, I guess, if there's any more investigations that might go on into the labs into the future or is, you know, you is mean that into Wuhan? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I don't know. They might have another like show show investigation, like the one we had with the WHO. They might allow like a new group of scientists. They might allow it some access to the, even the lab. But I mean, at this point, a year after the outbreak, they probably scrubbed it off clean, and there's really any evidence that the, they wanted to destroy, they would have destroyed by now. Uh, so I, I, I don't think it's like useful at all to have another investigation. Uh, so. so it's really dependent upon a whistleblower to get anything con like absolutely 100% or close to 100% oh, Well, they, if, if they really want to get like something investigated, they probably should investigate on the American side. Like look into mm. EcoHealth. Like mm -hmm. if, I don't know if they can freeze all their data or recover anything that might have been deleted or any other paper trail that is that, you know, is on the American side. Uh, yeah. Just if there's that database that the Wuhan Institute of Virology has deleted, maybe it's still somewhere in Eco health possession, or maybe you know some other lab has downloaded back, you know when it was still available. Maybe Ralph Barrick's lab has it. So I mean, there's other things that they can look into um, on the yeah eco health side, but like in China, probably you know they're not gonna um, essentially shoot themselves in the foot if they don't want to be investigated. They'll you know they won't let the world investigated as I said, because they, they don't have anything to, to gain from this. They're already mistrusted from like the West mistrusts China. So like, what do they have to gain to, to let another investigation? What do they have to get to? They're not going to admit uh, so loudly. They don't have anything good to, to, to gain from that. But I mean, yeah, we, we can still probably find things out and have more circumstantial, more circumstantial, or even more convincing evidence. But even then, you know, they'll claim that oh, it's all fake and your informant is a whistleblower is fake, never worked mm -hmm. here. And I mean, they still haven't really showed us where the Huang Yangling is, that, you know, student who used to work at the Wuhan Institute of Virology, who was rumored to be maybe patient zero, maybe rumored dead. And then Wuhan said, oh no, she left in, you know, 2015 and moved to Chengdu or something. Mm. But then they had her picture from 2018 on the website, which they later deleted. So that, I mean, that that's still a simple question that nobody on the WHO investigation ever like bothered to uh, investigate or ask, like, can we actually speak with this potential patient zero student? You tell us, you know, she's fine in Chengdu, well, can we get her on a Zoom video call just, you know, to see her face and confirm that she's alive and well? Because nobody has seen her since. Like, all, all they had were her uh, WeChat messages where she said, I'm alive. Anyways. <laughs> so many uh, uh, very suspicious questions that uh, I, I think, you know, in totality, they, they, they already have the answer that mm. what has happened and that answer is most likely a lab leak. Well, 
let's leave it there <laughs> on uh, that note <laughs> uh, on, on that note yeah. so wh- wh- where can uh, people keep tabs on you i guess i'm on twitter uh, it's pretty much like if you're interested in the lab leak side of things uh, and i'm on linkedin if you're interested in you know longevity therapies that we're developing so or just you know email me i mean yeah just through twitter i am or linkedin so we'll take it from there if you got any questions so. awesome thanks so much yuri yeah my pleasure it was fun Thanks for listening to this episode. The music you hear on this show is from the Jeff Lapp Trio out of Montreal. Find them at jefflapp.com. Shout out to Tara for doing the graphics for COVID on air. A huge thanks to my editor Jeff at Bean Co. Studios in Regina, Saskatchewan. Please visit ncoronavirus.org for more information on ECV. Click on Join Us. Through that, you can volunteer with ECV. And you can subscribe to our newsletter, which is full of great information shot straight to your inbox from our delightful newsletter editor, Tracy. Also, please check out the blog at ECV. And hats off to Scott, our impeccable blog editor. You can find ECV on Facebook and Instagram and on Twitter at ncovid19. You can find me on Twitter at Mr. Farden. It's at M-R-F-A-R-D-E-N. Until next time.